Hey, welcome back, First Assembly, to our Bible study of the book of Mark. Tonight we're going to go over chapter 4, and we'll see how far we get, because it is, it is a lengthy study. So we'll see, maybe we'll stop at verse 25, maybe not. We'll, we'll, we'll see how far we get tonight. Um, let me ask you this question. Have you ever wondered though, how, how some Christians can grow in their faith at great speeds where others don't? Um, have you ever looked at saying, you know, why some get excited about Jesus for a few weeks and all of a sudden, next time you never even see them again? Uh, what happened? And then there are others who get excited, kind of like after a honeymoon period dies over. It's like, eh. Everything slows down in their life a little bit. They, 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 do, they do serve God in some capacity, but it, it, it's not like they were. You know what I mean? Why are there different growth levels in people? Why do you see some people who are so hungry and others kind of like sip him? Almost like a, you know, like a spiritual flat tire. It's like the air just left the tire. We're going to learn some things tonight that we wouldn't know unless Jesus had told us through the Spirit. I mean, let's just be honest. Um, the parables are a way which Jesus spoke to others to, to reveal answers to those who really, who, who, who really hungered for God, who really wanted to know who God was and understand, God, what are you trying to say in my life? What are you, what are you saying even here? So let's pray real quick before we get into chapter 4. Mark, our Father, we thank you for your word today. And, and, and Father, we just ask that your Spirit would continue to reveal to us, Father, the things you're trying to teach us, Father, and help us to glean off of the scriptures in the book of Mark to understand how we apply those things in our lives. And we thank you, Father, for being with us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 1. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. A very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat in it on the, on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them, many things in parables and his teaching he said to them listen behold a sower went out to sow now this is important when Jesus says listen we need to listen and it's cool that Jesus is using the example for the people now listen they lived in an area at the time where people could understand about sowing seeds I understand how form, farming today is a lot different from farming from back then now listen back then they probably would have someone with, with, with like a pouch with a rope around the neck or around the shoulder there and they would just toss seed out to where they kind of troweled out where the seed needed to go. And that's something that they could understand. So Jesus speaks about, gives them examples on how they would understand. Like today, most preachers, most pastors, most teachers, uh, whatever different levels you're at, if you're preaching to a congregation or you're talking to a Bible study or doing something, need to share examples that people would understand. Most time people will use examples from their own personal lives or something they would understand. But he goes on and he says, he says in verse four, and, he's, and as he said, at, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. <clears throat> Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. Immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Another seed fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. The other seeds fell on the good soil, produced grain, growing up and increasing. It's yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. That's a lot. That, that's really a lot of, a, a lot of um, yielding. And he said that he, this is important, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So why are the purposes of the parable? Why, why did he do this? But it was interesting because in verse 10 he says this, And when he was alone, those around him with, with the twelve asked him about the girls. Now listen, there was this more than his, his entourage, his personal twelve. There's other people who, who wanted to learn. Now in the book of Matthew, Jesus gives us a question that the disciples had asked, but Mark did not. Why do you speak in parables, Jesus? Now, you have to ask yourself that question too. Jesus, why did you speak in parables? He says, Then the disciples came and said to them, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 and thir through 13, said this, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have in abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That's a scary, that's a scary scripture. Verse 13 says, This is why I speak to them in parables, 
The seeing they do not see, the hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. He says to them, and he said to them, in verse 11, back in Mark, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside everything is in parables. Take special note of what he meant by outside. Because in verse 12 it says, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Let's stop here for just a minute and wonder, think about this, have you ever wondered how people hear God's word over and over and over and over again, but never get it? The disciples ask, why parables? Why teaching parables and not just teach straight out? Why wasn't God, why wasn't Jesus just straightforward and just said, hey, this is what it is? It's interesting that you think about this. Growing up, my, my mom would make either homemade bread or cakes or some kind of things. And what she would do is take a, I don't know, a sifter and she would put her flour in there and she would tap it and, and, and as, in, a, in a bowl. And as she tapped this sifter, it was made out of metal. It was like a netting underneath, real fine netting. You know what a sifter is, and he, she would just tap it, and it would take all the all the clumps out. It would just refine it, and the parable create kind of a, a spiritual sifting out process that one reward or baffle the hearer, depending whether on they're on the inside or on the outside. So, ask yourself this question, okay? What makes a person on the inside? and a person on the outside. Okay? It is whether they want to hear what is being said. It is simply as that there is no secret password, no secret handshake, no codes. It's whether you want to hear what God is saying. Those who are on the inside who understand the Scripture and His Word, those who are the ones who have humbled themselves, their hearts to Christ, and they say, listen, I want to know I want to understand the Word of God. I want to learn and I want to grow. And you're probably saying, maybe even like I would say, well, doesn't everyone want to do that? And the answer is no. <laughs> no. Listen, and then to be really honest, there are some people who just come to church and they just listen to a story and they never understand or truly listen. Their arms are kind of like folded. I'm not saying like everyone who does his arms are folded like this, but I mean... You can see certain body languages of people. You can see their hard hearts. You can see it. Listen, and, and, and really, and it's sad because they're saying, listen, I'm not here to, to listen to you or hear what the Word of God is saying. You know, maybe something has caused them to be that way. I, I don't know. But there are people that are like that. And the people who come to God and ask, you know, I want to know, you know your will. And, and it's that's not them. They don't want to know. They don't want... They just come out of a, a relig ritual or religious duty. They've been, you know, been doing for years. They've really never took that step to have that relationship with God. They're the ones that, you know, they come in. They, they want to be mad all the time. They're angry all the time. They don't understand the world. Like, you know, and they're angry towards God because it's God's fault that everything's happening wrong in their lives. You know, you have to ask yourself, why do you go to church then? It, it doesn't make sense. These are the ones who have heard the word but did not open their hearts to receive the word. They open the Bible, and what they do is they try to find fault, and they're never receptive to it. Their hearts are so far from God, and they don't want to receive Him. And people, listen, when they read the Word, listen, they've already made up in their mind that they will never find truth in there when they read it. They receive nothing from it. And this is why Jesus spoke in parables, because if, if you're an insider, you're the one that wants to follow Him, who wants to learn, who wants to grow who wants to know who God is, and your heart is open to receive, and it's soft towards God. So listen, anyone in the day could have walked up to Jesus and asked for help. You know, and, 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 he put, and he, the genuine heart they did. But there was other ones that were saying, hey, you know what, hey Jesus, you know, after maybe he was teaching today, hey, what's for dinner tonight? Or, you know, maybe, maybe someone probably said, you know what, this guy talks in riddles. Forget this, this is ridiculous. Where is the desire for you and I or even them to learn what God was trying to say. They had no interest in God. Listen, people just don't get it in their heart because they're not willing to learn. They refuse to humble and to sit there and say, okay, God, teach me. 
Matthew chapter 13, verse 16 and 17 says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. They were the ones on the inside learning. They were asking the questions. They were reading the Old Testament. They were, they were searching out. Because it says in verse 17, For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and hear what you hear, and did not hear it. I understand that, that they, they were waiting for the coming of Messiah. It's interesting though, but now he was here and they could just walk right up to him and say, and talk to him and say, explain this to me. You know, even think about this. You know, when Pontius Pilate asked Jesus a penetrating question, what is the truth? I mean, he literally stood next to Jesus incarnate, God incarnate. And what did Jesus say to him? Nothing. Pilate did not want to know the answer. He knew the answer. He knew who God was. I believe he did. And, and it's almost like this. You know, did you ever have somebody come up to you and says they know you're a believer, but they ask you a question, but you can get a sense that they really don't know, want to know the answer, and they end up saying it's stupid, you know, even after you gave them the answer. You know, it's almost like you just waste your breath on people who aren't willing to hear it. Kind of like passing a pearl before the swine. It's like, um, it's, it, it's, it's, outside people just don't want to know. They, they just refuse to, to just humble themselves and, and to listen to what God is saying. But it says in verse 13, he says to them, do you not understand this parable? Then how then will you understand all the parables? This is parable is a key for you and I to understand the rest of the parables. So we need to get this one. We need to understand what Jesus was saying. In verse 14, he says, The sower sows the word. Now, we know the seed is the word of God, right? And he says the one along the path where the word was sown, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes it away. The word is sown in them. This is the seed in which it was scattered on the footpath. Now, no one wanted to put seed on a footpath because he knew it was going to happen. But in Matthew 13, it says this, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Now, this is the word that goes uh, into their life, and they just don't get it. Why? See, the parable is about the different spiritual heart conditions that create a place where the word of God gets rooted or does not get rooted. Now the footpath. Now, like today, we have we have most of us have probably concrete sidewalks. Um, they don't. They didn't have concrete sidewalks. I don't believe back then. They may have had some stones, some here and there, but um, where a path was at, a path was was a place where, like as a kid, we used to play in the woods, and sometimes there weren't paths into the woods. So what we would do as kids, we would just continually walk over a certain section every day if we go into the woods to hang out. And what that would do is it would beat down the weeds or whatever it was, the grass or the bush or whatever it was there. And what happened though, after a period of time, it got so wore down, it would be solid, it would be hard, it would be like concrete. Um, and how this is played here is that when we talk about where the seed fell, that it could not enter in because it was so hard. The seed couldn't take root. It's kind of like when you want to when you want to have uh, in your yard, maybe your grass yard has a bare spot and the ground is really hard. What you got to do is you got you got to till it up. You throw a seed on the ground. Normally, the birds are smart and they'll come down and look, or it will just die because if there's no there's nowhere for the seed to grab onto because they can't penetrate. Then you have to ask yourself though, how how hard does one's heart need to be that the word of God cannot enter in? Uh, no place to plant the seed. There was nowhere for it to go. A hard heart is the first one that we see. Someone's heart that has been so hard that the Word of God cannot even penetrate that heart. So let's move on to number two. Verse 16, it says, And these are the ones that are sown in a rocky ground, one who, when they hear the Word, immediately receive it with joy. That's a good part. Here's the bad part. And when they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while, then, when tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the Word, immediately they fall away. Now, the next condition heart Jesus reveals is the shallow heart. 
the shallow believer. Rocky soil. Now this could be, you know, soil with a lot of rocks mixed in it, so the soil or the roots can't really grab a hold of it. Or it could be, you could look at it as maybe the grind is so hard underneath, but there's a, a thin layer of, of, of topsoil there that it can grow only so much, but it really can't grab into a deep root. That there is no room uh, for the Word of God to take root and grow. Excuse me. This seed may germinate, it may start, but it has no place for the roots to take hold of and to grow. It's almost like this. They start praising God, and something happens due to their shallowness or their depths in their lives. This person uh, basically doesn't want any discomfort in their lives because maybe uh, you know, they're believers, but they begin to care too much of what others may say, and they back away. Kind of like a baby Christian who maybe you know, compromises the peer pressure. Some of this, you know, don't, you know, if, you know, I've had people talk to me all the time at church or on the phone, but when I see them in the public, they dart the other direction when they're with their friends. You know, and you get the idea, it's like this. We don't talk about God around our friends so they don't think differently of me. Kind of person with a shallow faith, shallow walk with God. And then the other one, so verse 18 says, And then the other one sown among the thorns, and they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches and desires for the other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. Now, this is what they consider the third condition would be probably, we'll say, the crowded heart. They don't have a problem recognizing the word of God, but their hearts are so tied to the world that they care too much about material things, power, money, their own things, their own will, that these things are so deeply ingrained into their hearts, but their heart is overcrowded for things of the world, and there's really no room for God in their lives. And, it, and it's interesting as we look at these first three, can you recognize anywhere in your life where maybe you, re, someone was trying to give you the word of God, but you, you were in a place in your life where your heart was hard? You know, it's like, I don't want to hear it. I can remember when I lost my first child, and my heart, I'll be honest, it was really hard, man. <clears throat> and it was a, my faithful mother in law who started saying, Mark, you need to praise God. And I was a believer in Christ. I allowed my situation. It was a hard thing to go through. She didn't care. She kept on like <laughs> she kept on beating me with a shovel, trying to get the softness of my heart to go. And you know, and and it, it worked because I began to praise God. But I can I can I can attest to some of these things that you know, the shallow heart or even crowded heart. You know, we really as believers need to really search our hearts and see where we're at. Are we, you know, what condition are we in? Maybe you know. Maybe you've gone through some of these, and maybe you haven't. That's great. Maybe you've gone through the best one at the end. We, we're going to call it the heart that is receptive, where the, it has good soil, uh, has plenty of room for growth. Because verse 20 says, But those who that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. That's a good yield. That really is. And this is a heart that is open and humble and teachable. It's a it's a decent person who comes to Jesus and wants to grow and learn. So let me ask you this question, though. Just even this small section, it's kind of an understanding. Which one are we? Jesus is asking us every day, which one are we? Because this can happen to us every day. There are days when I wake up, I say, Lord, I have to say, Lord, check my heart. Where am I at? Am I receiving what you want to say? Am I allowing you to water? Am I allowing you to till the land? And, you know, how do we get kind of these hearts in our lives? How do we get a hard heart? How do I get a shallow heart? How do I get a crowded heart? How do I get a heart that's on good soil, a receptive heart? One that really wants to, to know what God, and, and, and what God's saying. And, and to me, it's a heart that's open, it's humble, and it's teachable. It's one that is pliable. It's kind of like I think about the potter and the clay with God. can just throw us up on the, the spinning wheel and we're spinning, if you've ever seen that before, and they, and they shape it as they go around. Add a little water to, to, to like smooth us out a little bit. And that's how we get a heart that's full like that. That it, it, even in this parable, it shows us that that our heart, that it can vary in different degrees, and we all must be cautious um, 
of that. You know, can something be done to a heart that's really not perceptive to God's word? Is there a possibility for someone's heart to change? I say yes today to see the power of the Holy Spirit and allowing Him uh, to do the work that He needs to do in our lives. You know, and it, it parts of me, you know, I, I believe that God allows things to come into our life to bring us to a place to be humble and tender towards Him. And, uh, and, and if you know somebody with a hard heart, we need to pray for those people with hard hearts that we discussed. And if we have a hard heart, I think, you know, sometimes I think about this, that even in our lives, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom just so we begin to listen. And I think about the prodigal son where he wanted his inheritance, he ran off, spent it. But he came to a place in his life where he was wrong and he hit basically rock bottom. You know, and and I think sometimes there are some people that have to go through that. And there are sometimes I don't think that there are people that have to go through it. It, 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 it all depends on these hearts or conditions of the heart. Depends on, on how responsive we are to God's Spirit. Or are we listening to what He's saying? If the Word of God is not making an impact in my life, I'm in trouble. And I need to ask God, why? Why why am not why is not your word seem alive to me? Why is not your word seem fresh and, and powerful and, and, and just amazing to me because you know no matter how many times you read the word the word should just be in a place of this excitement what God's doing and then Jesus goes on in the next verse is a lamp under the basket and he says to them verse 21 is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed and not a lamp or not on a stand now normally when we think about a light what was it do? a light illuminates the room when I walk into this room I get the light switch and the light gets power to the, to the light and it turns on, it illuminates. If I don't, if I don't hit the switch, it defeats the purpose of the light, correct? I mean, let's just be honest. Why did you put the light in there? <laughs> You're not going to use it, right? Now, there are many Christians today who are out there who hear the Word of God, and hear me, but they cover it up. They hide it because, I mean, they're believers in Christ, but but you can think about the shallow person that they're most like closet Christians. You ever meet a closet Christian? Maybe, maybe they're baby Christians. We know they're immature Christians, but who would take a knowledge of Jesus Christ and the Savior and the richness that He gives, the salvation He gives, and then not tell somebody? I've been in both. I've been in my life, so I've, been, I've worked. I worked in the world for my for my income. I served God then, and now I'm blessed to have. I, I, I work from God and get my income from God. And it's like, I got my income from both from God, but you understand, I pet make for a season of my life. So I understand the, the imitation, the peer pressure you get from people. But this is where we need not to be ashamed of the gospel and share God's love with people. Even if they laugh and spit in your face, it defeats the purpose if I'm a believer in Christ, but I won't share Christ. I won't let my light shine. You know, we have to ask you know, ourselves, why am I hiding the light of Christ? You know, I remember a story when, when I was young, young in the Lord, we were going to, me and my wife were going, and my family actually were going to a, uh, a, a baby baptism. We don't do baptism. I think it was a, a Methodist church that we were going to. They were doing a baby, or, yeah, they were doing a baby ba um, a baptism. We don't do those. We do dedications here at First Assembly. But, um, <clears throat> We walked into this into the church, and it was funny because each of us had Bibles, and you, and it seemed that the whole like all these people just turned to the side and go, "Oh, here come some Bible thumpers." <laughs> I know that seems bad, but I, I cool. I want to be known as a Bible thumper. That's great. We need not to hide our light, and are we hiding our light because we're filled with other things? Do our lives represent Christ? But it's interesting because in verse twenty-two it goes on and says. For nothing is hidden except for to be manifested, made manifest. Nor is anything in secret except to be to come to light. God's word is meant to be understood. If it seems hidden now, it's not hidden because God doesn't want you to know about it. If it's hidden, it's normally because there's a blockage on our end. You know, you, you see a lot of times when, when guys try to older guys are trying to get in shape and they're like they're losing breath or 
they, they're, they're ready to pass out because there's probably a blockage in her arteries causing the blood not to be pumped properly through the body. Same principle with us. If there's something we don't understand, we need to dig in and find out why aren't we understanding and seeking the face of the Father. Amen? Because in verse 23 it says this, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Are we willing to hear what God is saying? Are we in a place that we're receiving what God wants to, what, what God is saying? You know, what do we need to hear from God? Let's be honest. And we just need to ask, God, I need you. Now, there are some out there who, who think that only certain people can hear from the Word of God from the Holy Spirit, I mean, you laugh at them. I you know, heard, I heard someone say, "I scoff at them," and then and they laugh. The Word of God is for everybody. Listen, if you're listening to this, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be an apostle. You don't have to be a, a prophet. You don't have to be a teacher. When you read the Word of God, the Word of God is for everyone. You know, even children understand the Word of God, and I understand. And sometimes, even the children understand the Word of God better than some adults. It's a process of us just submitting to God's will to understand what He's trying to say. It's quite, I mean, when we really think about reading God's Word, it's quite simple once you submit to Him and understand what He's saying. Matthew 7, 7 and 8, you understand this one. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened for you. For everyone who, who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. And look, in all sincerity, when I say look and ask, I mean, like, it's not like this. Like, real soft knock. It's like this. You want to beat the door down until and, until you get that answer. You want to keep pressing and pressing and pressing. I'm trying to say is this. You don't want to kick the door down, but in the spirit, you want to kick the door down. And, and, and you want to get in there and say, Lord, here I am. I, I need you to share. I need you to, to, to reveal to my eyes. And, and, and Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 6 says this. My son. If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with, with you, making your ears intensive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you, now listen, if you seek like, like silver and search it as hidden treasures, do you seek out the word of God like silver and knowledge? Do you seek understanding out? Do you seek it out like hidden treasure? If someone gave you a treasure map and said, at the end of this map, you're going to get a billion dollars in gold. I guarantee you will do everything possible to get to that gold, right? Here's the same principle. Are you looking for God's understanding word, or his wisdom, his guidance? And are you seeking that? Because it goes on in verse 5 and says, Then you understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. It's not about a passing relationship. It's a full heart thing. It's not like a pass by relationship. It's full time seeking God. Listen, there's a lot of action terms in that small proverb in there, but search God's word like you would look for money. Or like you lost, say you're going to an appointment, you got to get to your doctor's appointment, and you can't find your keys. What do you do? You go crazy looking for those keys because you got to get to the doctor or that appointment. Is it precious to you is the word of God? Is it precious to you? What are you seeking in your life? And, what are you, and where are you going to find it? That's the problem. We can go seeking things for our life, but we can go to the wrong places. Like, listen. Only go to a Bible study. When you go to your Bible study, receive only what you dig out of it. It's just truth. Because in verse 24 it says, And then he said, to them, Pay attention to what you hear. <clears throat> with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. Okay? What do you do with what you receive? Do you ponder on the knowledge and understanding of what God is saying? Listen. Let's go back to the analogy. Because I was going to say something like, if you only take small portions or small bits, you're going to receive small bits or very little insight. When a person wanted to sow seed, and depending on what they... How many seed they threw out? They threw one seed out. <laughs> they weren't going to get much. But as they threw the seed out, they sowed more. And as you seek God out more, the more you seek God, the more you'll learn. The more you'll understand. If you read your word once a month, say you only read, I don't know, say you read uh, a chapter 
a week or a chapter a month, you're not going to know who he is that much as well as somebody who reads maybe a chapter a day. It goes on and says, For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The promise is more will be given. And did you, did you reply, or I'm sorry, did you apply, did you reply to what you received from him? And another warning is this. Do not, or don't lose, what you received. We need to pay attention to verse 24. It's important. Because the measure you use will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. Think about this. Meaning like, pay attention to me, meaning like, take heed. Look at it carefully. Do you perceive, perceive, do you discern? Isaiah 66, 2 says this. All thing, all these things my hand has made, and so all things can, came to be, declares the Lord. But this is one whom I will look. He who is humble and, part, and constrained spirit and trembles at my word. Think about even like when we look at David's life. We know we can see David's life and it was, it was a train wreck. But his heart was so soft and tender towards God. It was just amazing that you, know, you kind of want to have, you want to say, I want a heart of David, but don't do the things David did. You know what I mean? We say we want to, we, we should have the heart of Jesus. That we're the, let our hearts be like your heart. But we, can, we can't relate to Jesus because we're with all, because he's God. So we kind of pick a human person in the sense, can we be like them or be like them or be like them? You know, <clears throat> we want to be like Jesus. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's, you know, that's something we need to be doing. So, you know, as we read these scriptures, and as, as Jesus is teaching us, be careful of your heart. Don't have a hard heart. And if you're having a hard day, ask God, God, you know, straighten me out. Don't, don't, don't fear it. God, God, I'd rather go to God and say, Lord, I really messed up. My heart's not right. I did something wrong today. Will you forgive me and then help me not to do that again? Can you help me do this or that? Can you help me through the situation? You know, and don't and, and don't run away from God. Run to God. Amen. We're gonna start the next session of this of this of, this, of, of the book of Mark, chapter four. But as we as we look at this next session, it seems like there's the developing theme of the kingdom of God. And as Christians, we hear a lot about this in the Gospels. And let me ask you this question: Do you know the definition of the kingdom of God? So, like I said. If someone would come up and ask you, or maybe maybe um, a stranger, an unsaved person, or maybe even a baby Christian, would you be able to answer them what the kingdom of God is? Is it heaven or is it not? What what is it? Can you can you tell me like can you explain to me what that means? What would your answer be? And a lot of Christians, I think, at the moment's notice, would come up would be very hard pressed to answer that. But it's interesting as this said, we first we first hear about this <clears throat> when about the kingdom as John the Baptist came on the scene. Remember when he said, prepare the way of the Lord? So let's go to, let's flip back a few chapters in Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, think about this. This is how they used to herald the coming kings. Now, when we think about Romans coming into town, they would say something. Um, even like nowadays, we have news media, we have TV stations. When President Trump or Vice President Mike, Mike Pence comes in, and and they, well, they're coming to town. What do they do? The news says the president's coming, the vice president's coming, or some you know some dignitary's coming. They'll make it, and everybody will start saying, hey, look, this guy's coming, this guy. And this is kind of what happened without the TV set. More verbal. And this is what's happening, that um, people would go around, John the Baptist is saying this, people go around and hear this. The king, it, you know, he's traveling to and fro, and he's coming back and forth. And you got to remember, though, at the time, the, the scriptures, the, they, they were ready for a Messiah to come. Remember, they're under, they're, the Romans, they're under Roman rule right now, and and the Old Testament scriptures talk about the coming of Messiah. We're going to touch base with that a little bit. <clears throat> the people would hear that the king was coming, 
And what was Jesus talking like? The kingdom of God is at hand. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 says this. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he was saying is repent and believe. Jesus spoke and all the people began to see and start to believe. And we have to understand, now this is what I talked about a minute ago, that the Jews had a specific idea on what the kingdom of God was going to look like. First, they thought it was going to be a military kingdom. One where, where Jesus was the Messiah was coming in with power to, to liberate them from their captives. That Jesus would lead the fight and would oust the Romans. Get rid of them. They were under Roman oppression. They felt that, that God would exalt Israel as the greatest nation and uh, they would be blessed by the hand of the Lord. But what's sad is this. Jesus did not meet their expectations. And how many of us set up expectations too? We, accept, we set up expectations for other people. We set up expectations for ourselves and we end up falling. We don't, we, we, and, we, and, we, and they don't mean we get all bent out of shape about it. Jesus would, would speak to them about the kingdom of God and leaving them scratching their heads. Wait a minute, are we talking about the same, the same, we'll be like this, are we talking about the same kingdom here? Wait a minute, aren't you supposed to be, you know, and he's like, uh, nope. And even, even from their earliest days, listen, they were taught in how the kingdom of God would be and what it was like, and it was not what they thought it would be. From the earliest days, listen, they were taught as children and as they grew older. Now, there were times religious leaders and people would ask Jesus about the kingdom of God. And they had gotten confused because it was not going the way they felt it should have gone. Luke 17, verse 20 and 21 says, Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. I mean, don't they understand what he was trying to say to them? Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, or behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. I mean, dude, I am here. I'm the kingdom of God. But they couldn't grasp that. Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of your world. Now, most of the times when we see earthly kingdoms, our personal understanding is this. One, it could be a hostile takeover. It could be a time where countries war against each other and they take over that country. Too. It could be people voted in, like our country, the way we have a democratic country, in the sense that um, we we have the opportunity to vote Democrat, Republican, liber uh, you know, uh, Independent, or uh, many of the other ones that are out there. We vote people in the office, or it could be kind of like in a country like we could say England, who who has an inherited royal line that could roll our royal line from, back from a thousand years. Oh, that would be pretty cool if you have that much hate. Your understanding of your family lines, but <clears throat> that's how earthly kingdoms are. But they're getting this, and that's what they're probably thinking. And and, and like, well, kingdoms are set up this way, you know. Think about it. this one gets taken over, and this is what they're thinking probably in their own mind that the Messiah will do. But Jesus talks in these parables about the characteristics of the kingdom of God to help you and I to know what it is and how it's made up. There, listen, there's no deep theological lecture. There's no uh, professors. There's no all these people, him ha talking around. Jesus talks about the kingdom in a, by painting a picture in words for all to understand. He does it in simple pictures, simple words to describe common ideas that spoke of the kingdom. <clears throat> the parable of the seeds growing. So let's go to this one. Verse 26 through 29 of Mark chapter 4. And he said, The kingdom of God is like a man who scattered a seed on the ground. He sleeps at night, rises at day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself the first blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. <clears throat> but when the grain is ripe at once, he puts it to sickle because the harvest has come. Think about that. Think about in the kingdom of God planting seed, how it rises up, down. Read the scripture over and over again. It's just saying that he's given to us here on the heels of the parable of the sower. Understanding that when we talked about the sower, the scatter of the seed dealt more of the condition of the ground, more of the hardness of the heart, the, the condition of our heart, and how the seed fell on that 
and how it applies to our, our lives, how the Word of God applies to our lives, and how we allow it to sink into our hearts. Now, the emphasis here is not on the condition of the soil, but it's on the mysteries of the growth. On the mystery of the growth, how does it grow? And <clears throat> maybe the mystery of growth in, in that our agriculture area is not... Maybe it's not as a great uh, today as it back then. They did not. We understand a little bit more how things are and grow right, in, in our time in history. I think we do about how things and what things happen. The point here is that it's to convey the kingdom of God and how it grows according to the purpose and plan of God, uh, which is why it grows in a mysterious way. You think about a seed. We can understand, but back then you think about this. They didn't have the schools, and everybody break it down, but you throw a seed in the ground, put some water, and it grows up. Boom. It's easy. It's simple to understand. But nowadays, you have people that will break it down. Well, there's cause of this and this and this. And why can't we say, you know what? God created it that way. It can grow, and boom. It grows. But it says, He sleeps and He rises day and night, in, in verse 27, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. He knows not how. Remember, He spoke to a people who thought they knew how the kingdom of God was going to grow and thought the kingdom of God would advance in a certain way. And Jesus is basically telling him, listen, you're wrong. I'm not coming here to take out... <clears throat> the kingdom of God is not here to take out the Romans and your oppression. That's not how it's going to come. This is important for us to know that it grows mysteriously. The farmer does not stress over the seed growing. He doesn't. And without his intervention, the seed sprouts life and grows and bears fruit. The point is that it grows by the hand of God, the will of God, the purpose of God, and not man who brings it about, but it's God's purpose. It's not man's purpose that, that does it. It's God's purpose. People are getting excited about seeing miracles. They're seeing things happening. And they, and they knew, and, they, and, and all the people they knew, and they were around them. Even the zealots thought that what what they could do, we could use a person like Jesus. We could really rally behind him and proclaim him king. And he could throw the yoke of Rome off of, off of Israel. But the kingdom of God will not be built by man. Now listen, God will use man. We can, we'll, we can be his hands and feet to, to proclaim the gospel of people. But ultimately, it's, it's God's power and his strength behind the kingdom. It's not ours. And it's interesting that a lot of times, <clears throat> as I grew in the ministry, I got the opportunity of different seminars, how to grow your church, how to do this, how to do this, and what's best for your church, what's best for your church, and, and stuff like that. And it's interesting that I've gone to many different seminars, and I've seen a lot of people get sucked into this. Now listen, you can glean off of some things with other people's manly wisdom, but when there's a guy who has a mega church, and they said, this is what we have done. And this is what you should do. You should emulate what I have done and, and watch. You'll, you'll get great growth. And it's like, you know what? That places a lot of stress on an individual just trying to meet those expectations because every community is a little bit different, you know? And each person's uh, character character is a little different, perspective is a little different. And it's, it, and, and it's like man can try so much to grow God's church. And listen, you do have to get out there. Your name has to be out there, and you, and you have to go out, but you have to be out there meeting the community, building a relationship with the community that you're in. You know, you, because what happens is if you're not careful, you'll go, remember if you go back to the four, the four seeds or the four heart conditions, in your in your church you'll grow people who have hard hearts, you'll grow people with shallow hearts, you'll grow with people with things in the world too tied in, not enough room, crowded hearts. And then you, you can grow people with good hearts, but that's what we need to be careful of because, because you can have great outreaches, you can do that stuff, but and you can plant the seed, but is the seed going to be effective in where we want it to be? We want to plant seeds in people whose hearts have been, been to, to, or the soil has been toyed over and overturned. We want to so, see God soften their hearts and the word be received and they grow and they flourish. We don't want the... It, it's hard to say, but we don't want to raise up a people with hard hearts. We don't want to raise up a people with shadow hearts. Or even hearts that won't receive God or give enough room for Jesus. And we need to be careful. And so many times people will go to these seminars and they get, this is how we do it, this is how man, and, it's, and God grows it. You just got to make the effort to, to share the gospel with people in the community around you and allow God to grow. Because it says, but when the, what's interesting about this is those. <clears throat> how the kingdom of God is, is that 
But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts it in the sickle because of the harvest has come. This represents the end, that the harvest will come at the end of the age, in the millennial age, meaning at the, at the end time. This is the kingdom of God. God will grow the church. God adds. God will take away and God adds. Okay. Just a quick recap, because then this is a long chapter. <clears throat> First one is this condition of your hearts. Where are you at? Is your heart hard? Is your heart shallow? Is your heart um, doesn't have enough room? Is it crowded with things of the world of the world? Or is your heart pliable enough for God to use? Amen. It's just true. Is your heart ready? And it is. How is your witness today? Are you hiding your light? Are you hiding what God has been doing in your life? If so, I challenge you to allow your light to, to start coming off. Don't crush, don't don't fear, don't like be crushed under peer pressure. People making fun of you or laughing at you or or you know, what trying to get you off your game. Know that that God loves you and God wants you to share with those people even if they make fun of you. It's okay. Share the gospel with people. And then lastly in this chapter we're going to talk about the parable of the mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's about, I guess it's about the head of a, the size, maybe you could say the size of a, uh, maybe the head, it's a little bigger than the head of that pen. Or maybe I have a, uh, the, a, like a pin, a head pin. Really small, but it grows. To, it grows something you wouldn't think it would grow that big. But here's what we're going to talk about today: the parable of the mustard seed. In verse 30 says, "What can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for?" Now, emphasis on compare. Here, I'll, I listen. I want to use the language of slim, similarity to talk about the kingdom of God, but we'll, he will use an example that we all can understand, like like he just did. He says, "It's like a grain of mustard seed in which." When sown in the ground is smallest of the seeds on the earth. So you know it's pretty small. And yet when it is sown, it grows up, becomes larger than the garden plants, puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now this is a comparison of the smallest of seeds to the largest of plants. I said plants. Now we are hearing a parable from, listen, over 2,000 years. And we are living in the midst of the mustard seed plant. We're in the middle of the plant. If you think about when he's talking about this, he plants the seed. Now, look, at this is about Christianity. For the last couple thousand years, Christianity has grown from a seed. Remember, it's a seed. It was a birth. It was at the beginning. When the guy starts, the 12 disciples started spreading the gospel, it was at a seed place. It, it's growing. But now, you know, it was, it, it was basically in a limited place, say, Middle East, maybe a little bit of Russia or China, a little bit of Europe, you know, a little Africa, a little bit. It was just grown around. It wasn't where it is now. Now we can see that Christianity has grown around the world. So basically we know that if we would compare it where we're right now, the seed was at the beginning when Jesus spoke. The disciples started growing the seed. Remember? It started growing up. And then as people started serving God, it grew and, it, and people traveled around the world. They started growing. So Christianity has been gone around the world. Now, when Jesus spoke as a teacher, he traveled around in a limited area on the earth, right? And his disciples were following him. Now, realize, Jesus was not the only traveling preacher or prophet. This was something that was not uncommon to others have following. Listen, when Jesus was done, the ones he raised, Paul had some, Barnabas had some, and some of the other ones that went around in missionary journeys began to preach. And now some of the ones that we don't know who they preached to probably had the same thing. And it began to spread. It began to grow. Okay? Some would rise up and some would die out. But there were some that would go. People probably wondered, you know, even then, you know, because of because you had people, when Jesus spoke, he had crowds of people, right? And then you had some other people speak at the same time, and they died out. So you had to wonder, though, were people looking at this, oh, is this Jesus going to actually make it, or is it going to grow? Or is it going to die out? Was the Jesus thing going to last? Because remember, there's other people doing the same thing. Now, and, you know, and that does bring question. But you really think about this. 
if we're going to compare the mustard seed in the scripture as, as the church, is it good that the church has grown so much? <clears throat> because in verse 32 it says this, Yet when it, when, it's, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Think about this. Have we gotten so big that I want to put this. Let, let's do it this way. If you remember when we talked earlier about the sower and the seeds, right? And remember that the birds were involved and were considered not to be favorable. If you remember, it was the enemy who snatched the seed on certain soils. Think about this now. Now, if we're going to go to follow expository consistency, does the birds here, or expositional consistency, does the birds here have a negative uh, um, connotation? Meaning, when it says in verse 32 that the birds of the air came to make nests in, in, in its shade. Now, earlier we read that the birds came down and stole the word of God from the person because their hearts were so hard. Now, there are many biblical teachers and scholars that are out there that believe that Jesus is not warning, just warning us about not only is the kingdom of God is going to, to start small and grow large, but that it also will be influenced and infested at some point with worldly and satanic influences from time to time. Let me read that. There are many Bible teachers and scholars that are out there today that believe that Jesus is not just warning us about not only is the kingdom of God is going to be st start small and grow large, but it is also going to be influenced and infested at some point with worldly and satanic influences from time to time. Think about that. We can look at history over 2,000 years and say, has this happened? I don't mean like, um, it's like I'm not talking heaven. I'm talking, when we think about the kingdom of God, the, we're looking at, I'm talking the church, the church itself. If the church is a mustard seed, it grows. And it grew around the world in our day and age. Has, um, have has it been influenced and infested at some point with worldly and satanic influences from time to time? I say yes, it happens. Um, one uh, one section I want to talk about over over I don't know over half of that time, roughly say a thousand years, and it was they would consider it the Dark Ages. It was due to the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not picking on the Catholic Church. So forgive me uh, if you're Catholic listening to this, but at one time. Around 312 AD, Christianity became a Roman state religion. It was popular to be a Christian, also politically. I'm not going to get into political games in the church. But around 500 AD, we were plunged in what the world would call uh, the Dark Ages, to around 1500 AD, when the, word, when the Word of God came only from the church. You didn't have a Bible. People didn't have the Bible. The Word of God wasn't being preached in a sense that you could go somewhere and talk. It was only the church controlled the whole thing. Then we, we know that the Catholic monk named Martin Luther got saved, born again, and started the Reformation. He was telling people that the way the Catholic Church was interpreting the kingdom of God was absolutely unbiblical and corrupt. And it thrusted the church into a thousand years of darkness. Not saying God doesn't always have a remnant, a remnant uh, but the larger expression of Christianity which was ruled by the Catholic Church was corrupt and dark. Let's just be honest. We need to really learn about our history. And have we seen birds in the branches and thank God for who brought us back into biblical view? Yes. Listen, revival we, you know, breaks out and where we come out of complacency and laziness. When, when, when do we really want to see the truth come out? When do we really want to show the people the truth? What is the picture of the kingdom of God? It is where God rules in our hearts and man not calling the shots, but God. You know, even today, they, they, they look at the word and they, they have the authority over the word. 
that's not scriptural. A man named Vance Havner was an evangelist. He once said, as long as the church wore scars, they made headways. When they began to wear medals, they caused languish. The church in 312 AD became politically advantageous to confess the faith in Christ Jesus was heading down the tubes. The church grows in persecution. Why can't the church confess faith in Christ? It, 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 it became politically advantageous. It says, with, much, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them, and as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without parables, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Private teaching and understanding. Listen, he gave his he, he, he taught them right. And now we're coming to the last narrative. I know it's been a long chapter, but... So I want you to go back over and over again, because I probably... Maybe we'll recap a little bit next week, but... We're going to springboard into the next coming chapters. Is, um... Jesus calms the storm. And on a day... Verse 35, And on a day when the evening had come, He said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, He took to them in, with the boat, and just as He was on the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the winds, the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. When he was in the stern asleep on a cushion, and they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? He awoke and rebuked the wind, and said to the seas, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Why do you have still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the winds in the sea obey him. What a great story. We forget the story is not an isolated incident. We tend to talk about it, about it by itself, though. Jesus has been teaching all day long. We know from the other gospel accounts, people were trying to touch him, press into him. They were sick. They were had deformities. They were possession. Uh, place yourself now in disciples. You have watched Jesus do so many different miracles. You preach it, now it's time you have the opportunity to apply what Jesus has just shown you. God will give you the test, the storm, all that we've learned from scriptures, all that we've learned from people teaching us, all the different flavors that we receive from different people. Now it's times that God was going to say, okay guys, you see what I just did, now it's your turn. Listen, I'll be honest, I hate test, tests and quizzes, but what's interesting is that you find out what, what, what you remember, what you knew about the subject you were studying. Did the disciples have the faith in all that they had learned in time with Jesus, at the time that Jesus met them? They were all the say, no, had, you can ask them after the three years, but all the times that Jesus met them, they seen what he was doing. Did they understand? Did they learn? Did they grow? Because he says in verse 40, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? <clears throat> Why are you fearful? Why are you cowardly? Almost like describing a person who loses their moral gumption, their fortitude. Basically, guys, why are you being such big cowards? Now, some of these guys were fishermen. They knew the dangers of storms at sea. But they probably said this, well, let me tell you why I'm afraid of God. Not only have these guys seen the power of God manifested in front of them over and over again as people have been brought to the sick. Jesus did this many times. But how many times do we have to see it before we get it? How many miracles do you need to see before you see? At first trouble, at first sign on their own, these guys bailed. And I can understand that. Have you ever bailed after seeing many things God has done in your life? You're like, Oh God, what are you doing? All these men, all these men who had gotten in the boat, if they were asked about the power of God, they probably would have got an A plus. Hey guys, tell me about Jesus. I mean, is the power of God really going through them? They probably said, Yeah, this guy is really, I mean, God's really moved this guy's life. But we know the promises of God. We could get we could answer people if if asked, but if we were placed in a situation where we were afraid and scared, 
what we have said then. Is God there? God, where are you? Where are you in the midst of my storm? Look at the symbols that are here. The story of the parable itself. The boat is our lives. Our lives are on a river. We'll look at it this way. Our boats are the lives. The water is an unstable world. Our lives were in an unstable world. You have to admit, even now, our world is really messed up. We really need God to move powerfully. And I believe it's only going to get worse until God comes back and sets up His kingdom. Plain and simple. That's how I feel. Um, the wind and the waves are the trouble and the trials that we face. So the boat, our lives, the water, the unstable world, the wind and the waves, troubles and trials. Jesus sleeping in the boat, God being distant or indifferent to our pain. And, and listen, in a fallen world, storms happen. We're going to face some things. But know that God is not distant or indifferent to our pain. Know that. God is God's there. Sometimes though we think He is. Hey God, where are you at? I mean, I can see that. You know, you're, you're rowing your boat. You're in your boat. And you look back and turn around. Jesus is sleeping. Hey, Jesus, do you see what's going on? Same principle in our lives, though. When, thing, when we're faced with things, do we see that? When we look at this passage, if we look, if we look at it as a parable... Jesus has the power over the storms of life. Jesus experienced them alongside of us. So remember, Jesus is going through this with us, and Jesus loves us and he saves us. Storms do not worry Jesus. Understand that. He's not fearful of storms. We see that when he told the one, hey, peace, be calm. You know, be still. It's comforting that Jesus was calm in the midst of the storm. While we're we're freaking out, we're losing our minds. Jesus is already calm. He's like, I got this, guys. Jesus is a total peace, and that's where the, he wanted the disciples to be. That's where we need to be, at peace when we're faced with storms. And it can be difficult at times. He may be asleep in our lives sometimes, or maybe not thinking about us, or thinking about what we're going through. But no, God, God knows what we're going through. Disciples were just, disciples were safe as, as, as when Jesus was awake and as Jesus was sleeping. They were safe. <clears throat> we need to start looking beyond our circumstance and trusting the power of Jesus with eyes of faith even when we don't see the answer Jesus wants us to learn how to be peaceful learn his peace and lay a hold of his peace John 14 27 says peace I leave with you my peace I give you not as the world gives do I give you let your hearts let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid I know you're saying it's easier said than done, but understand the power of God is controlling our lives. Even when the storm's all around us and it looks like we're about to die of doom and gloom, God is there. Jesus is there. No longer, um, the longer we live, the more danger we will face. Understand that. And it will be difficult. It's good. You know, as a Christian, you face certain trials. They're difficult when you're there, but when you go through them, you grow, you learn faith. But as you get older and the more mature you get, the harder the tests come. But we, but the dangers that we face, but our faith should be growing as we face that danger. I know it's been a long, a long class. It's probably I don't know, maybe an hour, maybe forty-five minutes. But there's a lot that we that we went over today. Go back and and just reread what I talked about and go over some of the notes you've taken, um, especially about. What it, what it is the kingdom of God I'm hoping you can answer some of what the kingdom of God is you know there's been a thought about kingdom of God is is his whole kingdom and heaven is a part of that kingdom you know kind of like a burrow inside of a state or a burrow inside of a uh, township or you know what I mean um, but get ready uh, start studying start learning start growing in the things of God but know that anything that you face God will be with you but it goes all the way back, even to this one. Go back to the first thing we talked about. Where's your heart at? How much do you seek the Lord? And where where will you be found? Are you will you be found in the Lord? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. And I know we covered a lot. But Father, I ask that your spirit would speak to each of us tonight, Father. Over each of these sections, Father, as we reread them. Lord, that you would continually bring new revelation to us. Not reveal to us what's been hidden, Father, what we don't understand. Help us to seek you. And Lord, and, 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 gain, and, and gain wisdom, Father. Help us to keep a humble heart. 
Let our walks always be fervently after you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be blessed, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week.